Good morning, friendship, community. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Indeed. I'm going to read from Psalm 22. Jesus uh, on the cross, uh, he quotes from this psalm, Psalm 22, verse 1. And this was a bit of a reminder of, of Good Friday. And this is David writing. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why did you dump me miles from nowhere, doubled up with pain? I call to God all day long, no answer, nothing. I keep at it all night, tossing and turning. But this uh, psalm, it famously, it, it changes course. And then David writes, he says, you God, don't put off my rescue. Hurry up and help me. And he carries on. Here in this great gathering for worship, I have discovered this praise life. And he writes, everyone on the hunt for God is here praising him. Live it up from head to toe. Don't ever quit. From the four corners of the earth, people are coming to their senses, are running back to God. Long-lost families are falling on their faces before him. God has taken charge. From now on, he has the last word. Psalm 22. Let's uh, sing this morning. Let's stand. We're going to sing, Christ is risen. Let no one caught in sin remain inside the light of inward shame, but fix our eyes upon the cross and run to him who showed great love and bled for us, freely you bled. Let's so sing together. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave.
rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. And so I'm going to invite my wonderful wife up. She's going to share announcements with us and maybe even a little recap of our trip to Mexico.
This is also at Camp Drone 16. There's Naomi and a few other girls here. We spent the morning painting, washing windows, sweeping, all that kind of thing. Another evening, we went into the city of Merida and we uh, put ourselves just outside of the hospital. It's a very well hospital. People from all over the, I guess, county, state will come to this hospital for care. And because there's such a need, a lot of families and friends will camp out on the outside of the hospital and wait for their loved ones, or wait for their friends to get treatment, and just kind of live there. Um, so we serve pancakes and drinks, and just and went with a team of translators, um, young adults from America, who came with us, and we just went out on the street, got to know people, invited for some food, and shared about Jesus. A definite highlight for our family was meeting our compassion child. This is Jose. So before Christmas, compassion came to Friendship Community Church, did a presentation and had a whole table in the back um, full of kids actually that are from Mexico because they knew that we were going there. They thought, oh, this would be a great opportunity um, to sponsor children from down there. And fortunately, we were able to get picked up by compassion, drive to Jose's community, meet his sister Shirley, his mom Maria, and father who's just outside the picture. They made us breakfast, we got to swim in a cenote, which is this really fun pool of water, kind of underground, and then go to Jose's home, they made us a beautiful cake, and just a sense of time, and it was really, really special. We also did a little bit of sightseeing. This was on a really hot day. <laughs> um, we went to some Mayan ruins that were not too far away and just learned a little bit about Mexican culture. This is part of our team up there and James in the front. Nice and rosy cheeked and feeling hot. Another community we went to, I believe it's called Canacine. Also uh, low income. It was really neat. We went to this park that was in the middle of this neighborhood and we played games. We partnered with uh, a youth group there that works with kids and put on our program, um, got to pray for the pastor and the leaders there. And it was really special to see um, all these other people on the outskirts kind of watching what we were doing, kind of coming in, you know, taxi drivers, tuk-tuks going around, dogs everywhere, cats and, and uh, just to see that it was a light in a, in a dark place. It was, it was really special. At the base in Progresso, which is just on the coast, we thankfully had a pool. Um, the ocean wasn't very nice to swim in, so we were very grateful to have this. And it was a refreshing dip in the afternoon before we had our mandatory siesta. We all had to go to our rooms for an hour and rest because it was an action-packed schedule and we didn't want to get sick and none of us did in our family. This is Pastor Gamma again. We went back a few days later after we did the service um, for his camp and we put on the program, got to know some of the leaders there and a lot of the kids from the nearby village called Baca came to the camp and uh, yeah, it was a, a true blessing for them and for us. And we also had lots of fun. These are some sombreros that the twins put on, Seamus and Naomi. Um, it was a... a a packed week, but there was moments where we could play games and be goofy together, so this is just a fun, a fun picture for them. I asked my kids this morning what their favorite part of Mexico was. James, who's four, loved seeing iguanas. He's mentioned that a few times. Um, Naomi said she loved playing with all of the Mexican kids. Seamus loved all the food. We had a lot of tacos, a big variety, and they were so delicious. And Nova said she liked everything. Okay, I have an announcement here I don't have a slide for. Next Sunday, there will be a meeting for teachers and helpers for the kids' Sunday school. So that's not for the tots room for the littles or the teens, it's the middle group. We are um, changing the format a little bit, and so we want to go over that with the teachers and helpers. 
We are still looking for more volunteers. That would be lovely. So if you're interested in that or are currently serving, please come out after the service next week. We'll meet for maybe 30, 40 minutes just to go over that. Today's scripture is from Matthew 28, 1 to 7. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, now I have told you. Thank you. All right, so we're just fresh off a uh, lot of kids ministry and we're uh, pretty excited about all of that. And so this morning on the inspiration of Emily, uh, we want to get our kids involved this morning. So if you are young, <clears throat> we've got a gift for you. Emily's going to be on the side of the stage, and she's going to empower you with a green object. <clears throat> come take a look at Levi. So kids, come on up. Get your green palm leaf. And we've got a special song for you. We're going to sing, Give Me Oil in My Lamp. And adults, let's stand. Let's get the clappers out. Get your two clappers out. We need the clappers. And we're going to lead this song. And as we sing the chorus, sing Hosanna. That's right, James. You're going to wave that palm branch in the air. Here we go. Here we go. Give me oil in my lamp. Keep me burning, burning, burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. Sing, here we go. Hosanna, wave it. Hosanna, sing. Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing, Hosanna, sing. Hosanna, sing. Hosanna to the King. Give me love in my heart. Keep me serving. Give me love in my heart, I pray. Give me love in my heart. Keep me serving, serving, serving. Keep me serving to the break of day. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing. To the king, give me peace in my heart, keep me resting. Give me peace in my heart, I pray. Give me peace in my heart, keep me resting, resting, resting. Keep me resting till the break of day. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the king. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Okay, everyone clap. Give me joy in my heart, keep me praising. Give me joy in my heart, I pray. Give me joy in my heart, keep me praising, praising, praising. Keep me praising till the break of day. Here we go, wave those. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosan
Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Woo! Okay, we're going to ask the kids to uh, head off to your classes now with those green branches. You can take those with you, souvenir. And kids are dismissed. And tots are dismissed. The teens are staying in today.
All I see is a mountain. You see a mountain move. Go. And as I walk through the shadows, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, and I am safe with you. So when I'll fight, I'll fight on my knees, my hands lifted high. Oh God, battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Battle belongs to you. And if you are for me, who play against me? For Jesus, there's nothing possible with you all I see are the ashes you see the beauty I see is a cross God you see the empty tomb So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, my hands lifted high. Oh God, that belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night. Oh God, that belongs to Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees. My hands lifted high. Belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night, oh God, thou belongs to you. Oh God, thou belongs to you. morning as we uh, invite Tim to come and, and share the word with us. Thank you, God, for Easter and uh, what it means to gather as, as your people and uh, to sing your praises. And so we give you thanks uh, this morning uh, for the resurrection of your son, Jesus, that transforms our hearts and our lives, uh, God, that shapes who we are as we are gathered before you under the cross, and uh, we pray, God, that you would speak to us through your word this morning. Holy Spirit, whisper to our hearts, uh, change our lives, uh, Lord, that we might continue to always praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 
Well, good morning, friendship. He is risen. Oh, it's so good to gather together today on a day like today um, just to be the people of God and, and celebrating what Jesus has done for us. Um, I want to start today just uh, by thanking the, the people that helped for the Good Friday breakfast. Uh, how many of you enjoyed the breakfast on Friday? It was really good. Um, and and the, the, the best part about it, I was talking with Lorella afterwards, and, uh, and Lorella was just saying that um, what, it, what a joy it is uh, to work with a bunch of volunteers that are happy to be there, that love to serve, that love the church, that love the people, uh, and they're eager to be. People actually showed up early, and, uh, and, and they, they set up everything and cleaned up, and uh, it was just a real joy to watch. And so uh, that's how it should be, right? That's how we as the family of God should be, uh, just to, uh, to serve our God and to serve one another and be the church together. And so uh, great job. Keep it up. Continue serving, and uh, thank you so much for, for all that, that you do. Well, Easter is a, a really special day for us. It is the day that we celebrate Jesus risen from the dead, defeating death once and for all, and, and he gives us new life. Uh, for those who can see that, that this is true, it is life-changing. It gives us hope, it gives us purpose, it gives us meaning, it gives us value. We, we know who we are because of Jesus. We know where we come from. We know what to do. When we have questions, we know where to go. We can dig into the word of God and, and pray in the spirit and be a part of the body of Christ for support. And Jesus rising from the dead is, is a wonderful, life-changing event, and yet there are so many that can't see it. And maybe you're one of those this morning. And all of us have been there. We've all had that experience seeing but not understanding and hearing but not listening. Or like me this week, typing and nothing actually coming out. <laughs> there, there, there are moments in our life that, that cause us to wonder. We sense that perhaps there's something more but we either don't see it or we don't want to see it. It's just beyond this veil that's in front of us. Mark chapter 4, verse 21 says, For there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed, and nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him listen. But not everyone listened, did they? Instead, they heard what they wanted to hear, and they, they listened to themselves. And there was a veil in front of their ears, and so the truth that Jesus said didn't actually sink in and change their life. And we often live with this, this veil in front of us, even if we, we don't really know it. I, I was thinking about um, uh, how we view celebrities, right? Uh, do we view celebrities in, in the proper way? Do we see them as, as people? Or do they have too much influence over our lives? I know you've seen people on TV or in movies, maybe famous sports players. And we live with this veil thinking that these people are important or better than us somehow, right? When I, I, I grew up in Saskatchewan. How many of you grew up in Saskatchewan? A, a few of you grew up in Saskatchewan. Um, okay, um, who are the greatest celebrities in Saskatchewan? The Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Okay, Saskatchewan Rough Riders are the biggest celebrities in Saskatchewan, and you see them on TV, and, and, and you go, uh, well, now it's Mosaic Stadium. Back then it was Taylor Field, and you would go, and you would watch the, the riders play, and, and, and it didn't matter what the temperature was. It could be minus 40. It could be plus 40 all in the same day, and you would just go. You would go and you would cheer on the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and people would put watermelons on their head for some reason. I still am not entirely sure why on that one, but they do and, and it looked cool. And, and we, I mean, we would, we would, when they were horrible, we would chant fire them. And when they were awesome, they were our saviors. And it was just like, these were the celebrities in Saskatchewan. Anybody remember what happened in 1989? No, 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 no. The, 
Saskatchewan Rough Riders won the Grey Cup. Oh, that was, oh man. I'm going to kick you out after a while. <laughs> and if you remember in 1989, I was 10 years old, and this was huge for a 10-year-old boy. Your, your favorite team wins the Grey Cup, and the very last play, Dave Ridgway kicks the game-winning field goal. There was no bigger celebrity than Dave Robo kicker Ridgeway. <laughs> Man, I, I remember sitting, we, we were living in Regina, and, and I remember watching the game and then hearing the horns all across the city just going like crazy. The city just erupted. It was the best moment of my young life. And then that next summer, people moved in across the street. And the guy came over and introduced himself to my dad. He says, hi, my name's Dave Ridgeway. And I was so confused. I was so confused because, okay, you have to understand, we, we didn't live in a fancy neighborhood, right? We, we lived in an old neighborhood. You know the one with like glass stucco on the sides that chewed up your arm when you rubbed up against the side of the house? <laughs> Right? Like, it was an old neighborhood. It was small houses. Like, like we, we, weren't, we weren't rich. Like, this was, this was not a, 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 I mean, it was okay neighborhood, but, like, it wasn't the, the best neighborhood. And I was so confused because, because Dave Robocop Ridgeway lived in a castle. He must have. Look how famous he is. He kicked the game-winning field goal. What in the world is he doing in our neighborhood? It doesn't make sense. He's just a regular guy with a mullet. <laughs> there, there was a veil on my young eyes thinking of somebody much greater than they actually were. Sure, they were famous. Sure, he, he kicked a field goal in a, in a big moment. But it was hard for me to see things for how they actually were. Like, CFL players don't actually make a lot of money, especially if you're a kicker. And you might be good at sports, but you're just a regular guy. Sometimes, though, we, we see what we want to see, don't we? Not how it actually is. And Jesus came, and he's challenging his listeners to those who have ears, let them hear. What he's saying is, look, you have preformed opinions. You have a, a world view that someone else created. And if you listen through that world view, you won't hear the message. My preconceived notion was that Robo Kicker wasn't even human anymore. He would never come to our area, let alone live next door. I had to let go of my blinders and, and see it for what it was. So I wonder if you come today with blinders on. Perhaps, perhaps you have a veil in how you think that's preventing you from seeing the goodness of God. In the series we've talked uh, a few weeks ago about the veil of innocence. How God made Adam and Eve and he placed them in this perfect garden and he gave them this protection from evil by allowing them to be innocent. I, I don't know, it, I get this picture of um, the joy on a young child's face when you come home after work. Right? I remember uh, I used to come home from work and my son would just run to the stairs and launch himself off the stairs so that I would catch him. And I was like, dude, you're almost six foot tall. You've got to stop this. <laughs> no, it was, it was a long time ago. You know, he was two and he was just so excited. Daddy's home! But do you remember the first time you disappointed your child? Maybe you got caught in a lie. Maybe you, you disappointed them. And the look in their face of, oh, you're not perfect. There's a veil of innocence. 
And God protected Adam and Eve with this veil of innocence and then they disobeyed and they sinned against God and they found themselves on the other side of this curtain naked and ashamed and separated from who, from who God is, from his love. Next in our series, we looked at the tabernacle. And tabernacle is just a word that means tent or dwelling place. Um, and, and it is the, the dwelling place of God where God chose Israel to be his people and he made a promise that I will be your God, I will protect you, I will be with you if you obey me. And part of that was the tabernacle, the place where they could physically come and connect with a holy and spiritual God. And it represented the barriers that there were. Right? We talked about there was only one door and you had to sacrifice something to get to God. Something had to die on your behalf. The priests had to wash clean. They had to light the lamps in, in the holy place so they could see in the dark and put out the showbread of fellowship and light the incense that was like our prayers going up to God so they, they could connect with God. But there was still this barrier between God and and man, a curtain that divided these two rooms, the holy place and the most holy place, where God dwelt. And there was a separation between the two. Most people uh, can understand that, that God is, is unattainable on our own. But we, we come up with our own solutions for that, right? Right? There's a couple of solutions that, that I, I kind of thought of. And, and one is, is we create a religion. One based on, on works. That if you do a certain amount of things in the right way, then you can connect with God. I, I like that way. Right? It seems, it seems logical to me. Just tell me what to do. We'll work hard to do it. And we'll get it done. And we'll connect with God. And that's, that's kind of what Judaism became, following the rules of the law so that you can save yourself. And, and that's why when Jesus came, they were so upset because he said, no, 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 that's not the way it works. You're not good enough to connect with God, no matter how hard you try. He came to seek and save the lost. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good. Not even one. Ouch. Even the religious can never be good enough to connect with God. It's just not in our nature. There's another way that people try to deal with this problem, and it's the way that Eve chose. When the serpent used his subtle uh, way of questioning who God is, and he says, you can be like God. You can be like God. And Some people deal with the issue of feeling separated from God in their lives, not with religion, but with making themselves God. The final authority. Or by making others around them God, the final authority. Sometimes it's celebrities. Sometimes it's scientists. Or politicians. Or pastors. We make other people the final authority and we start to believe them instead of God. And they always let us down. That's called idolatry. But Eve did become like God, didn't she? Knowing good and evil. And yet she found herself on the other side of the barrier. Not able to have a relationship with God anymore. I hope that today, if you have ears, you will hear. And allow God to describe for you a proper understanding of the world. And this is not the opinion of man. It's not a made-up story. 
It's a story that goes back thousands of years, written by God through over 40 different authors over a span of 1,500 years. It's the story of the gospel, the good news. The story that brings hope to our life. And you might say, how do we know it's from God? Because the same themes flow from the beginning to the end. God is working out his story of how he has come to the people to save us. How he has taken the barriers that exist because of our sin and has knocked them down one by one until we can come to him. From that first sin in the garden, we as humans have only gotten worse. Left on our own without guidance of the law of God, we become lawless. If you remember in the book of Judges, it says the people did what was right in their own eyes. That's where we are today. There's the separation between us and God and sin keeps getting in the way and our society keeps drifting farther and farther into darkness. The tabernacle and the law was supposed to help remind the people that it was God who reached out to us. It was God who wants to have a relationship with us, but it is us, his creation, that have sinned and turned away from him. We've become his enemies, and that is why Jesus came. At Christmas, we hear the story of Jesus' birth. Born of a virgin, he lived a sinless life. The Gospels tell us the story of how Jesus lived and, and how we should think about God. He challenged our worldview to have a worldview that that is solely based on God's view. But there was still this barrier that people would repent, but they still had sin. There was still the curtain. So we come to the temple, the permanent tabernacle. A couple weeks ago, we talked about about the tabernacle and, and, and how these were all barriers And how Jesus fulfilled every one of them. We we talked about how um, we we stopped in in the holy place. And then there was this curtain in front of the holy of holies. This veil. And it was a thick curtain that divided sinful people from a holy God. And you would come in through the one door. And Jesus is that one door. And you would make a sacrifice. And all the way along, there were barriers that Jesus has fulfilled. And once a year, after washing and purifying himself, the high priest could enter into the holy of holies, the most holy place, and offer the atoning sacrifice, sprinkling the blood onto uh, onto the Ark of the Covenant to atone for the sins of the people. In Jesus' time, this curtain was a woven fabric that was about four inches thick. It was a substantial curtain. It was a physical reminder for the people of this separation that we have with God. If you were with us for Good Friday, we looked at the trial of Jesus and how he was crucified for crimes that he didn't commit. And as he hung on the cross and he died there, some incredible things happened. And this is Matthew 27, verse 50. But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. Suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split The tombs were also opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And they came out of the tombs after his resurrection, entered the holy city, and appeared to many. This is the veil that separated us from God, sinful man from a holy God. And it was torn from the top to the bottom. A four inch thick curtain doesn't get torn by accident. No human hands can tear it. But God 
tore the curtain. And there was a new temple for us. The model of the temple and the sacrificial system was all completed in Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is now our temple. And you might remember when, when we talked about the tabernacle, that, that there, was, there was one door. Well, Jesus is the door. He is the sacrifice that washes us clean. He is the light of the world that lights the holy place. He is our fellowship with God, like the table of showbread. He is our intercessor that brings our prayers up to God like the altar of incense. In Jesus, there is no more barrier. And we have full access to the throne room of God. Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works. Not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day approaching. This barrier that exists between us and God has been torn in two. And we now have Jesus who mediates for us. And we gather together, not in, in religion, coming to a temple built by hands, but coming to a temple that is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior. In Him, we can walk and talk with God once again. For the people at the time, there was one more barrier to be removed. Because Jesus died on the cross and the barrier of the veil was torn, but, but death still had a grip on us. And Jesus was buried in the tomb and a stone rolled in place. In Matthew 28, verse 1. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to, the, to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning. And his clothing was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. The angel told the women, don't be afraid because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. The glory of Jesus is that he didn't just die for our sin so that we can have a relationship with God, so that we can gather together as his people but he also rose from the dead and he conquered the grip that death has on us. Death is no longer something to be feared. For death, when you are in Jesus, means that this earthly body ends, but we will, it will be replaced with a paradise body. I talked about paradise on Friday. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. That means garden. Like the perfect garden, the garden of Eden, where we walked and talked with God and had fellowship with him. Before sin ruined everything. 
Jesus was raised to life so that you could also live. The question, though, is, okay, so what? What difference does that make in my life? Well, that depends. And it depends on you. You see, the reality is is that Jesus has done this for us. Freedom from sin is there. Hope is there. Eternal life is there. It is accessible to us, but we have to put ourselves in a position to receive it. First, we have to have ears to hear. Do we want it? Because in order to receive this gift of life, we have to recognize that we are dead in our sin. We are sinful people that need saving. And that's harder for some than than we care to admit. Especially if you are successful. If you have a lot of money or stuff. Our prideful hearts don't want to admit that I need a savior. It's hard to admit that even if I'm a nice person, even if I do lots of good things, I don't think of myself as a bad or evil person. There's still sin in my heart. And I can never be good enough on my own. And our our punishment for rebellion against God is death. Some choose to walk in darkness because they don't want to see the light. They don't want to admit their own failings. So the first step is we need to believe that we are sinful people and we need a Savior. And the second step is we need to surrender. We need to recognize that Jesus is that Savior. We need to surrender our life to him. And that can be even harder. Yes, I I need a savior, but, you know, that's just for the end part. This part over here, this is fine. I got this. I got this, Jesus. Don't worry about it. I need the the ticket to heaven at the end, but, but the gospel is about surrendering our entire life. And it can be a process to do that. We have compartments in our life, right? This is my work. This is my reputation. This is my marriage. This is the dark closet that nobody ever gets to see. And we need to take it all and surrender it. And allow God to speak into it and transform and change us from the inside. How do we do that? Well, we need to confess. We need to confess. Admit the wrong things that we've done or the good things that we've done for the wrong reasons. And then we need to give our will over to God. And this means that that sometimes we take things that are in our life that we're trying to protect, that we're trying to hold on to, that we're trying to keep close. We have a vision for where that needs to end up. Sometimes that's our children. Sometimes it's our career. Sometimes it's our bank account. We like to hold it close. And the gospel says you need to let it go. You need to give it back to God. He controls it all anyway, so just admit and surrender. And give it back to him. Sometimes that means God will take it and do something that you didn't think about. Sometimes he'll take it and give it to somebody else. We need to be okay with it. The next step is to rejoice because you are no longer your own God. You no longer carry the responsibility of directing your life anymore. The weight of carrying sin is lifted and there's hope for the future. Not just for life right now, but but even the fear of death is gone. 
Because Jesus lifted the veil between us and God, it is torn and death is conquered and we live a new life. Some come to this place and it's good and they surrender. And then sometimes we start taking things back, <laughs> right? I was talking with a, a godly man the other day and he's going through one of these tests of faith Right, and, and he's, he's uh, a little bit older, and, and he said he was praying, and he said, God, I'm, I'm too old for these tests of faith anymore. And then God reminded him that Moses was like over 70 when he was called into ministry, right? Just because you're older doesn't mean we trust God less. Just because you're successful, it doesn't mean you trust God less. Things are going well or things are going terrible. Does it mean we trust God less? No. We need to ask him for our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Care for me in this moment. And the rest is yours. We need to trust in God today. Maybe you are here and you have no hope. And you are carrying the burdens of sin and anxiety and pain and fear. And maybe you have heard the message today that Jesus paid for your sin and he loved you and he died for you on the cross and he conquered death and he rose again. And that hope is accessible to you. But you need to surrender. After the service, we have elders up at the front here and they would love to pray with you. They would love to pray with you. But this is not a prayer that, that you pray once and then you're good to go. It is a prayer of confession. To admit that, that I am a sinner and I need a savior. You don't need to air all your dirty laundry to the elders. That's not what they're there for. But we do need to confess that I need a savior. I can't do this on my own. And we admit that that Jesus is our savior. He gave his life for us and I wanna give my will to him. We need to ask the Holy Spirit would come upon us and guide us and direct us and start showing us the things in our life that need to change so we can honor God in, with our whole life to fill you with joy and with peace and with love so that you can give that to others. And it won't happen all at once, it's a process, but, but what will happen at once is that you will become a child of God. And you become part of his family, the community of God. And you become part of the, the love that we have for one another through Jesus. And it is the start of a journey of, of learning and growing together. Removing the veil of our own worldview and seeing the world through the eyes of God. Seeing things for how they are. And as we do, our faith will grow and our hope will grow and we will be transformed and we will be made new. And the love of God will flow from us and the spirit of God will start working through us and we will be a shining light to the world around us. Bringing the love of Jesus to those who are lost. If that's you this morning, we would love to pray with you and welcome you into the family of God. For those of you who are already in the family, may this morning be an encouragement to you. A reminder to give your life back to God. Sometimes there are things in our life that we just slowly start taking control back. Actually, God, I want it this way. This is a reminder to open your hands, give it back to God, and allow him to do what he wants with your life. Allow him to take the burdens from you, to carry your load. Give your anxieties and your fears back to him because he controls it anyway. Allow him to change you to make you new. Our God is good and he loves you and he longs for you to come to him and to see things how he sees them. He, he longs for you to be the people 
that he made you to be so that you can do the things that he's called you to do. Today we remember Jesus rose from the dead and he will make all things new. And today he wants to start with you. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you gave your life on the cross, that you died for us. We thank you that you defeated death, you rose from the dead, and in you we have new life. Give us courage this morning to confess our sin, to acknowledge you as Savior, to turn our will over to you and allow you to work in our lives. May you transform us, make us new, make us into the people that you want us to be so that we can do what you call us to do, to be a light to this world, to share your love, to share this gospel, this good news that all people can come to the Father through you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and uh, respond with this song, Glorious Day, which uh, goes through the gospel, buried beneath our shame. But you called my name and I ran out of the grave. And I was buried Call my- 
Easter, right? Yeah, it is. Let's sing uh, an Easter classic as we close this morning. Goes like this. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day, Jesus Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. Amen. I want to thank you for being here today. Happy Easter. Uh, don't forget, where are the kids meeting for the egg hunt? We're going to do it in the sanctuary. Right in the sanctuary uh, in, in a few moments. So uh, the rest of us can, uh, uh, if, you, if you're wanting to pray with the elders, they'll be at the front here. And, and the rest can go out and grab some coffee and cookies. And uh, thank you for being here. Happy Easter, everybody.